now the recording has start, started. Yeah. Um, well, well, welcome everybody to today's colloquium. I'm Gordon Bain from the University of Illinois, and I'm chairing this year's colloquium committee. It's my great pleasure to introduce today Chimiao Si from Rice University as today's speaker. But rather than extol Chimiao as a truly outstanding condensed matter theorist, who works primarily in quantum criticality, quantum magnetism, and superconductivity of strongly correlated electrons, I thought I would leave the job to Chat GPT, which produced a very nice haiku. Chimiao C, wise, unveiling secrets of states, quantum realm, realms arise. <laughs> uh, Chimiao received his BS from the University of Science and Technology, China in Hefei in 1986. He was then a graduate student at Rutgers, yeah. And then he came to the University of Illinois as a postdoc. Uh, I'm sorry, he was a graduate student in Chicago, went as a postdoc at Rutgers, then came to Urbana, and again as a postdoc where we met many years ago. He joined the faculty at Rice in 1994, where he's been ever since. His research has been quite well recognized. He received Sloan, Sloan Fellowship, a Humboldt Prize, Cottrell Award. And in addition, he's a fellow of the British Institute of Physics, as well as the APS and the AAAS. He was named a Ulam Distinguished Scholar by the Center for Nonlinear Studies at Los Alamos. And just this morning, Chimia out got the very good news that he had been chosen as one of 10 Department of Defense 2003 Vannevar Bush faculty fellows, one of 10 in the, in the entire nation, uh, for, to focus in his research on extreme quantum materials. The five-year fellowship is, is the department's most prestigious single investigator award for basic research. It's really quite an honor indeed. But let me join him. Give him let me also add that, that Jimmy Yao is the corporate secretary treasurer of the Asper Center for Physics and thus plays an exceedingly important role in the functioning of the center. And today he, he will tell us about correlated, correlated electrons and loss of quasi particles. Yeah. Be heard. Okay. Uh, um. Got it. Work. Do this. So, oh, um, I want to begin by thanking Gordon for a very nice introduction and uh, thanking the colloquium committee. Uh, for inviting me to give this colloquium. I, I feel extremely honored by that, especially in Aspen uh, Center for Physics, which uh, uh, for me uh, has made a tremendous, tremendous impact in terms of uh, my uh, physics career. So uh, the subject is um, uh, correlated electrons and loss of quasi-particles. I am... Um, I've assumed in a conversation with Emily, I told her that I assume everybody knows what electrons are, but I have not assumed the quasi-particle is. That's, uh, uh, I'll explain that. But uh, um, before I get started, so I'm here um, as a part of uh, a condensed matter program titled New Directions on Strange Metals in Correlated Systems and uh, the names of my uh, called conspirators for this program. Uh, he and Ki, I believe, is in the, in the audience. And so uh, what are we doing uh, in Aspen, nice place like Aspen, thinking, uh, considering strange things like strange metals? And so let me uh, start from the beginning. Uh, we consider um, ordinary really, uh, things that we can actually see uh, in our daily lives. and but. Uh, in fact, we're dealing with uh, uh, constituent particles yes. enormously large. So um, Carl Sagan famously said that uh, there are more stars in the universe than uh, there are sands uh, on the beaches of the Earth. So to play on that theme, uh, it's in fact true that uh, there are more electrons in any grain or a typical grain of sand, 
uh, than uh, stars in the universe. That's a huge number of electrons in any piece of substance that uh, we, and as matter physicists, uh, study or uh, experiment or consider. And uh, that's a typical number, the Avogadro's number of electrons in a uh, solid, and more specifically, focus on crystalline uh, solids. And so they are very closely packed. The average distance between electrons, a couple of angstroms. So if you work out what E square over several angstroms uh, is, uh, that's about several electron volts. And the one electron volt uh, converts to a temperature scale of several, uh, uh, of more than 10,000 Kelvin. And so if we can, as matter physicists, we consider low energy physics in a sense of the scale of room temperature, which uh, even in Houston is about 300 uh, Kelvin. And so that's, a, that's an enormous scale. So it's a, it's a, a, you can call it a quantum universe of electrons, which uh, are very strongly uh, talking to each other, interacting with each other. So can we ever uh, consider making progress to draw, to draw inspirations uh, from daily lives of uh, mostly the classical world, think about the H2O molecules, a typically same number of these, and they can be organized into liquid, uh, vapor, or ice, uh, depending on the conditions of this collection, uh, of the same collection of H2O uh, molecules uh, uh, would be uh, under. And so if we know these, uh, these are the uh, kind of phases that we learn in high school physics courses. And if we know the phases, we can also work out uh, uh, the transitions in phases. And uh, uh, in for uh, uh, H2O molecules would be only one possibility. There could be others, ammonia and other substances. They have fairly similar uh, phase diagram. The transitions involve some very isolated points, uh, which are critical, and I'll come back uh, to that. Uh, for the most part, you have a map of basis. Uh, if, you, if I know what the temperature is, if I know what the pressure is, uh, I would know what the, uh, how this H2O molecules would be uh, organized. So in a, a similar vein, we want to think about electrons, uh, which uh, as opposed to be uh, as opposed to H2O molecules. And I already said, uh, electrons are quantum, so that, that, that aspect uh, is different. Also, the focus is different. We have uh, these uh, names of curious classes uh, that uh, some of us uh, uh, feel very dearly about, at least for some of those. But uh, if you uh, work with these materials on a daily basis, uh, maybe uh, you can just think about just collection of different kinds of materials platforms that host uh, almost similar number of, very large number of electrons in them. And uh, we wanna ask are the electrons, uh, what, what are the conditions are that each of these materials platform would provide the electrons uh, to be organized in some particular way. And the consequence is quite profound is magnetism, uh, some aspects of it we know uh, for several millennia already. Uh, the superconductivity, which is uh, on that uh, time scale, it's more recent, and uh, topological electron matter is even more recent. And these are only uh, a few examples of the kind of functionality or states of matter that uh, this collection of electrons uh, could uh, get themselves organized uh, into, and some of them we believe are useful. Now, uh, so. Um, so as uh, theorists, we want to think about the organizations of these electrons. Then we go back to the textbooks. The textbooks tells us that um, we have a typical a model to describe uh, electrons, which contains the kinetic part, some uh, we'll call a band structure without any thinking, but uh, for people uh, not in the kinetic matter field, that word, those words may not uh, necessarily uh, uh, cause too much resonance. But uh, so think about non-interacting electrons, electrons, except for the fact 
they are quantum mechanical in nature, they do not, uh, they, they act independently of each other. They live in a crystalline environment. So there's symmetry associated with crystals. It's represented by this box, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that too much. And there's some interactions. So if we ignore interactions and half of the first state physics textbooks do that, uh, you just think about electron collection of independent electrons and they are fermions, they cannot share state. And as a result, this notion of any energy any surface uh, in the wave vector space and so on and so forth. So Fermi surface is where the action is because uh, if you, uh, in the case space, we go to the interior of the sphere, uh, the energy difference of the electron states um, Fermi energy is too large, large meaning, meaning, meaning that it's too big compared to 300 Kelvin. And uh, uh, likewise, going away from it, uh, the energy difference from the Fermi energy is too big. We don't particularly care about those electron reach freedom. So Fermi surface will play a very important role uh, in the rest of the talk as it does uh, in the daily lives of condensed matter physicists. And uh, we can uh, consider some typical four Fermi interactions associated with, for example, electrostatic interactions or some uh, effective representations of that. Now, here comes the quasi-particle. If you take a model, generic model, for many electrons like this, and do perturbation theory interaction, uh, and uh, if you prefer, uh, work with dimensionless quantities, the interaction is normalized by some energy scale associated with non-interacting electrons, which we call bandwidth, uh, W. So if U over W is relatively small, perturbation theory should work. And uh, uh, one could do perturbation theory to the first order, to the second order, to infinite orders, to show that genetically quasi-particles are resilient. So what is a quasi-particle? Well, think about a bare electron living in this uh, environment. And as I already said, there are particularly interesting electrons in the vicinity of the Fermi surface with energies which are close to the Fermi energy. And so if, uh, if, it's, if we, we do not have any interaction, Electron, it's an eigenstate the system. But interactions mix different states. So uh, in the end, uh, it's going to be an uh, electron will be expressed in terms of lots of many body states. But among these, there's one state which is uh, very special. It's a quasi particle in the sense that it has exactly the same uh, quantum numbers as the bare electron, except that the electron is also uh, act decaying. Uh, because of the interactions of mixing with uh, other many body states. So, as a result, this, uh, this fraction square root of z is actually less than one. Uh, but so long as it's non zero, you have a projection of uh, some, a, an object in this interacting uh, setting that acts just like a bare electron as far as its quantum numbers are concerned. And we can do uh, thermodynamics with the quasi particles. We can do uh, kinematics, uh, transport, and other things uh, with the quasi particles. And, and so if that sounds mysterious, mysterious, I refer you to uh, the book that on which I learned thermoliquid theory, which is the game the Kavanaugh. And I think that's still uh, the uh, standard of the field. You can do spectroscopy to see quasi particle. Imagine at uh, this is a, a spectral function associated with bare electron, which is a measurable quantity. Without interactions, it's a sharp data function with the area under it, that's one. Uh, but uh, in an interacting setting, uh, this, uh, this if is a sharp peak, yeah. sharp peak characterizes the quasi particle. And the area under which normalized by total area, uh, that, that gives us Z, the quasi part, the weight, of the quasi particle. So that's really, or that you need to know about the quasi particles. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so, why is it so resilient? Uh, uh, quite a few smart people uh, thought about uh, this Fermi liquid theory in terms of uh, uh, not beyond the perturbation theory in the renormalization group language. Fermi liquid uh, as a state uh, shows up in this renormalization group language as a fixed point. And as already mentioned, it's a robust. That's the 
uh, only fixed point that exists in infinite orders in derivation theory. So if we want to break the quasi particles, we can have to ask ourselves, are there some other fixed points in this many body system in the renormalization group? Oh. And so uh, very naturally, if perturbation theory, the, uh, in terms of interactions, uh, if the quasi particles are so, so robust, if we want to break it, and I'll come back to the reasons why we want to do that, um, we ask what happens to the non perturbed effects? What happens, what can happen when the interaction reaches uh, or goes beyond the strength of the underlying scale of the non interacting electrons, which is the bandwidth? And so, what helps is that if we want to go, go beyond the perturbed treatment of this many electron system, we want uh, one approach that's convenient is not to use the bare electrons as a building block. So if you do perturbation theory, the underlying, you do perturbation theory of uh, a couple of the harmonic oscillators, the harmonic oscillators are your starting point. That's the, the degree of freedom with which you work with, you couple them together. Uh, doing perturbation theory in interaction U of the electrons is basically committing oneself uh, to the building blocks for low, low energy physics. Uh, that's in terms of conduction electrons and there are other degrees of freedoms like four nodes we can work in, but I'm not, for this talk, I'm not gonna uh, worry about it. When the interaction is large, uh, it turns out that uh, there's some non perturbative physics that, uh, that uh, uh, develops at intermediate energy scales. So electrons will no longer act as electrons, in fact, act as spins because uh, they are localized. They bump into each other, they interact with each other, they repel each other too much, and they got stuck. And so they, there's a spin degree of freedom that acts the building blocks for low energy physics, it could be orbitals and other things. So the important point is that you can treat the problem uh, uh, scale by scale in, uh, in the very much in the renormalization group sense of theoretical physics. So, so that's sort of the general sense of how do we think about electrons, quasi particles, and uh, uh, the degrees of freedoms. Now, we are here uh, in this workshop here as a group, uh, interesting for the electron systems. So perhaps it's fair to ask oneself what are the most important issues in this field? And so we have a room full of condensed matter uh, uh, physicists. You'll probably get different answers to this question. Uh, so I, let me present the way I think of three most important issues in the coiled electron field. Uh, one is the age old question of origin of high temperature superconductivity. Probably there's no dispute that that's important. Uh, the other is the nature of strange metallicity, and I'll explain what strange metals are. And that's, I still think that there's no, there's not much room for debate. That's a central issue. That's why this group of people here in Aspen, July. Um, and then the third is the, perhaps the intersection of strong correlation topology. If you think about topology as a relatively recent field, uh, electrons are organized in such a way that they're robust. Uh, they're not, uh, or at least less susceptible to quantum decoherence. So these seems like very uh, important states that could have potential functionality, right? So I'll put that as, uh, as, the, uh, uh, as the three most important questions in my mind about the field of the coiled electrons. And uh, I'm going to, uh, in the rest of the talk, uh, tell you some tales uh, within the coiled electron field that uh, all connect one way or the other with uh, the, these uh, three uh, topics. And uh, uh, now, I already mentioned there are a lot of materials, uh, fascinating for the electron materials. I want to use a set of materials uh, to anchor my thinking. And so that's where uh, my personal prejudice uh, and experience comes in. I want to advocate that there's a one particular family of coiled electron materials uh, that serves a good anchoring point. Think about theoretically, think about issues, uh, including the ones which I outlined in the previous page. The reason is that, aside, you don't necessarily need to know what the 
uh, the heavy fermions. I, I personally have not seen too many of the substance of heavy fermions. But conceptually, uh, there are some of the electrons occupying atomic orbitals in such a way that they have a hard time to move along. And so the kinetic energy, the W, of these electrons is very small. So any small amount of interaction will make them very strongly uh, correlated. And so one could make uh, uh, the analogy with the graphical lanes that the electrons should live on the slow lanes and the electrons which are live living in the usual fast lanes. And so, uh, to do uh, theory, uh, we have to have some small parameters. Otherwise, it's not a control theory. And when there are no small par parameters, we invent small parameters. <laughs> but here, if you have electrons living on the slow lanes and fast lanes, the scalar velocity ratios of the two already serves as a small parameter. And that, that helps in controlling theory or at least control uh, guiding the thinking. So that, that's what I'm going to focus on. So I have two slides just very quickly describe what the microscopic ways of looking at such correlated materials are. I already mentioned that there are electrons which are strongly correlated. These are the F electrons. I think uh, the substance includes elements uh, of the, um, from the periodic table, which is like a bottom portion. And uh, they have partially filled F orbitals. These orbitals are very inner shell. They don't get to move around, to be able to move around very, very much. So W is very small, U is large. And as a result, these F electrons are strong, are localized and they act as spins. And then there are SPD electrons which live on the fast lane, represented by conduction electrons. And symmetry dictates that the spins of the F electrons can uh, interact with the spins of the conduction electrons, we call this a condo coupling, which turned out to be anti ferromagnetic. So there's a the magnetism of the spins, uh, the uh, conduction electrons associated with the SPD electrons, and the coupling between the two. And in that sense, relatively simple characterization of the microscopics. But uh, it turns out that there's a piece of physics which connects with the formation of the quasi particles that sets a stage for breaking them. And uh, so, so I already mentioned that there's an anti ferromagnetic change interaction between the spins, the local moments, which are these black arrows, the mobile electrons, which are these uh, red purple ones. And they form spin singlet, down minus down up. That's a maximally entangled uh, state. Now, uh, you can think of this uh, spin singlet uh, as a bound state of the spin, which uh, is a spin one. Uh, the spin one excitations coupled to the spins of the electrons. So in semiconductors, if you have had experience, you may have heard the word exciton. Exciton is the particle hole combination of the electrons and uh, in the triplet channel. If that's the bound state that's, that's formed in the ground state or following the rule of Feynman, we can think about excitations by just breaking what's in the ground state. And so if you have these three objects forming a bound state, you can kick an electron out, that's a bare electron living on the fast lane, or you can have this composite object, which is spin one, spin one half, so could end up with spin one half, and charge zero, charge E, and or minus E, and uh, so that, that, that object has the quantum numbers of a bare electron. And that's in fact a picture of this particular kind of quasi particles which have been introduced generally, except that this is a very cumbersome object to move around. So if you ask what's the Z, the, the weight of the uh, bare electrons uh, that's living in this quasi particle, a Z turns out to be very small. It's three orders of magnitude smaller than one. It's about 10 to minus, minus three. And so, so these are quasi particles, they're very fragile. The quasi particle weight is 10 to minus three. If we were able to do spectroscopy, as I illustrated, the area under that peak will be 10 to minus three of the total area of the entire electron. It's already very fragile. So perhaps we can break this dictation of the perturbation theory that I mentioned could not, uh, that, that must, uh, that made the uh, quasi particles to be resilient. If to begin with, quasi particles are already so fragile, maybe they can be destroyed. More readily. That, that's, well, that's where this uh, small parameter comes in play to, to give a good 
starting point. So with that introduction, uh, I'm, uh, as I said, I'm going to tell you several tales uh, on the loss of quasi-particles and uh, a connection with superconductivity, and also uh, the a similar type of physics, but uh, in the context of uh, for creating a new type of uh, topological states of matter. And so um, uh, here is a list of uh, my uh, collaborators. Uh, I think Shovik Sir and Jen Cano are in the audience. Um, some junior people, uh, Lei Chen is a, uh, I know you're a graduate student at Rice and will be on the postdoc market and uh, uh, several long-term collaborators uh, and also uh, people who are in the field of uh, uh, this heavy fermion, which is a venerable field, but I focus on the modern aspects of it. Uh, but the fortune of interacting with the people who are at the beginning of the field. So a uh, loss of quasi-particles, so the lenses of the condo systems, these are uh, quasi-particles which are uh, general to begin with. This is a slightly busy slide, I apologize for that, but I really want to uh, narrow down a very particular question. And so I already said, uh, heavy, fermion super, heavy fermion systems, the variable uh, set of void materials. In fact, the very first conventional superconductor or beyond ECS superconductor was discovered this class of materials. And by now is about the materials family. It's a very large family. And most of them have some kind of empty fellow magnet spin correlations, spin rate that F electrons acts like spins because they are so strongly interacting with each other. In most of these materials for good reasons, the spins have a tendency of following up, down, up, down, up, down uh, uh, pattern uh, in a lattice. That's what called empty fellow magnet, empty fellow magnet order. If they were static, most of these are not necessarily ordered, but they have these such type of correlations. And so the, the past, recent past, these materials have served as a prototype to study uh, criticality and, and which I've explained and strange metallicity, which I didn't explain either. And uh, so it turns out that this type of, uh, uh, this uh, subset of issues that have been extensively studied have not been added back into the question of uh, the mechanism for CPU connectivity. Uh, once again, this is a setting where the very first beyond Adin, Cooper, Schrieffer uh, CPU connectors were discovered. So to us, that's important, but the importance also uh, comes in some interconnections between these uh, correlated materials. So this is a chart that uh, Joe Thompson from Los Alamos kindly applied me. So the heavy fermion superconductors, they are extremely strongly correlated because of the F electrons. As I already mentioned that Z could be as small as 10 to minus three. In fact, uh, when they are quasi-particles, the quasi-particle weight is as small. And the corresponding energy scales are smaller. So that's why in superconductors, superconducting transition temperature TC sitting at this uh, left uh, bottom uh, corner. But at least on a log log scale, you can make a plot of superconducting transition temperature and effective Fermi energy. Effective Fermi energy is the analog of this W that I mentioned uh, in the intermediate energy sense. And uh, you can put this on a chart connecting through some other uh, superconductors all the way to recuperate superconductors, which holds the record of DC, of the superconducting transition temperature the ambient, in the ambient conditions, uh, reaching beyond your solving. And uh, so this is uh, three to four decades uh, on, on both the effective uh, Fermi energy scale and, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, the superconducting transition temperature. Now, uh, if you go back to the conventional superconductors, the Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer type, DC is usually on the order of 10 to the minus four or at the, at the most 10 to the minus three of the Fermi temperature. This slope here turns out to be a few percent, so, so several orders of magnitude. So in that sense, maybe there's some interconnection in the microscopic physics. So learning about mechanism of superconductivity, this class of material sitting at the lower uh, uh, left corner some general implications, so we hope. And so that's the um, 
and in addition, above the superconducting transition temperature, if you look at the physical properties, that's where the strange metallicity comes in. But if you have quasi particles satisfy Fermi statistics, uh, the, the existence of Fermi surface makes a scattering rate be extremely reduced. And in fact, as a result, the scattering rate would depend on temperature in a T square fashion. Yeah, I think. Uh, how was T not defined in this way? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yes. So uh, the question was, how is a T not defined? Uh, so it's a, some, using combination of entropy is probably the most direct way. Entropy, what's the temperature scale over which R log two is distributed uh, is, uh, uh, is one way to extract the effective second degeneracy temperature because of this uh, log two or log four degree freedom. And there are some other slightly more complicated ways of extracting T now. You can talk further, but procedure, the involved procedure is entropy, transport, and other. So, so if you look at this color scheme, uh, this color scheme here, the uh, green means uh, the, uh, it's one, this, uh, this uh, label gamma, that shows that resistivity versus temperature, and I was trying to say that if you have quasi-particle resistivity versus temperature, there's enough on crop scattering as a result, it would reflect the scattering rate, which is T square. And so for instance, various regions here have T square dependence here in the uh, blue region, here in the black region, what's labeled as Fermi liquid. But when you uh, go to some special regions in uh, almost like the liquid, the water, the stagum, air temperature, pressure, um, you see it's a T linear resistivity. And likewise here, temperature instead of pressure, it's a magnetic field, which is tuning. When C uh, I gamma comes out to be about one. So that, that's one way of defining a strange metallicity. We'll have it uh, as a workshop, we'll have a discussion tomorrow of many characters uh, there are that's associated with stranger metallicity, but uh, T linear resistivity is definitely one of them. And uh, it provides some hint about how to think about uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, how the electrons are doing. Now, uh, there's uh, uh, these materials, as it turned out, uh, has well-defined quantum critical point, as supposed to be the critical point I was showing you in the water, uh, vapor, ice, phase diagram, uh, those are normally driven uh, uh, critical point. Here, if you stay at zero temperature, uh, by controlling the degree to which the Heisenberg's uncertainty principles uh, is manifested, one can actually engineer different kinds of phases and transitions between the two. And if the transition is continuous, uh, that's the, that would be the quantum critical point. And so, so uh, one of the debate in the field is whether all these different coiled materials join sorts of exotic behaviors uh, are associated with a quantum critical point and a critical phase, something else. Here we can see very clearly that there's an underlying quantum critical point, which is surprisingly controlling a very large uh, part of the parameter space uh, in the, uh, when the temperature is non-zero. So uh, if one think about a critical point, the first thing one does is go back uh, to the statistical mechanics textbooks and Landau would say that the critical point is described in terms of uh, the critical degrees freedoms, which are the uh, low energy fluctuations uh, or, uh, of, uh, or, stat or long wavelength fluctuations of the order parameter. If it's a magnet, it's the magnetic moment, or if it's an anti fellow magnet, staggered moment. Uh, and uh, I already mentioned that these materials typically show anti fellow magnetic correlations, meaning that uh, the spatial modulation has a finite Q. And as a result, if you ask the question, what do the fermions are doing when they are coupled to such critical fluctuations, much of the Fermi surface will still contain fuzzy particles because there's no A space to connect uh, on uh, this fermion with some other fermion in the shell that's living in the vicinity of the Fermi energy. So as a result, in this case, in this canonical description of quantum criticality in metallic settings, quasi-particles would again be 
staying intact for much of the Fermi centuries. But if we want to uh, end up with uh, something that resembles stranger metallicity, uh, one way to go beyond that description is that somehow fuzzy particles get lost on the entire Fermi surface. So questions after that. And uh, um, so uh, one idea which uh, we had, uh, which was actually motivated by uh, some dynamics experiment, which I'll describe, is that even though these are metallic systems, so it's a metallic fellow magnet, the parallel magnet ground state is transitions, there's some almost inserting like a behavior where a subset of electrons go from components being able to move around and uh, being localized that's taking place. And so, so this is a sort of uh, the mechanism of uh, the condo sink deformation, which I already showed a picture for you, so to which, with, with which uh, the very fragile quasi particles everywhere on the Fermi surface at uh, as a weight of 10 to minus three, but non-zero. And, and uh, which is characterized by the non-zero value of this, some energy scale, that some other energy scales, which I'm not getting into. If this energy scale collapses at quantum critical point, the left is no longer this mechanism of making the quasi particles from these local spins. So the, a bunch of quasi particles which existed uh, will go away. And, uh, and the, uh, in essence, uh, uh, astrophysics colleagues not, don't necessarily know uh, 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 what uh, the mod insulator is. Uh, that's where the F lectures go from a turn in, localize some hidden mod physics that's associated with metal to metal. So that, that was the idea. And I, I have one slide which uh, shows you uh, just a, a hint about how we looked at this problem, which is that there's a condo effect, which I already mentioned to you, the local moments coupled to the spins of induction electrons. It's a local physics, but then there's also the exchange interactions, uh, which uh, is the competing interaction that forms this ratio, uh, condo interaction um, uh, forming a ratio is the exchanging interaction the Goodman, uh, uh, the RKKY interaction in the spins mediated by the electrons. And uh, so these are dashed lines and uh, we have a way to study the dynamical competition between uh, these two types of, of processes that turns out to be the way to start from fragile quasi particles associated with condo effect and destroying it. And uh, so this is, uh, ends up is looking at the fate of local moment that's coupled to the conduction electrons and is uh, the spins from other sites uh, represent some collective degrees freedoms, which we call the Bose Fermi condo model. I expect uh, uh, this to be uh, extremely clear, but the, uh, from a pragmatic point of view, we were searching for new fixed points beyond Fermi liquid fixed points. And it turns out that if you look at the problem this way, uh, is a Fermi liquid fixed point, and there's additional fixed points, which can uh, be done uh, that analytically from um, this uh, renormalization group calculations, but also numerically by looking at the anybody spectrum, see how it evolves. And uh, from the many body spectrum, we can establish the existence of these actual these points uh, in terms of finite size spectrum and show at this finite size spectrum, while well, when it's here, can be reproduced through quasi particles, quasi holes, forming some combinations. When you're at this red uh, fixed point, you cannot do that anymore. The quasi particles are lost. It's a anybody spectral way of uh, making the same uh, statement. So the, uh, the critical spectrum at the quantum critical point loses the Fermi liquid description and there's no longer quasi particles. So as a result, a number of uh, important uh, consequences which can be confronted in this experiment. And the first one we looked at is uh, uh, dynamics, uh, which uh, the condensed matter experimentalists can probe the spin dynamics, you can go to facilities to inelastic 
which are scattering and to measure the imaginary part of this dynamic of spin susceptibility. And in fact, that was the first puzzle why uh, these uh, data were showing uh, almost like body radiation type of uh, and scaling H bar omega combining with ABT and also some fractional exponent. This comes out because this fixed point, like the firm liquid fixed point, uh, is uh, in the in the uh, fixed point language is interacting as supposed to be Gaussian. So at the end of the day, KBT is the only energy scale in the problem. There's no more microscopic energy scales left. If you look at the low energy uh, physics, that's why the only KBT shows up. It's a, in the end, it's a dimensional analysis that actually works because the interacting fixed point. And uh, we worked on this exponent uh, by combination of different numerical calculations and it came out to be fractional that was very important because the starting puzzle that was posed by experiment was uh, how come there's this H bar omega of a KBT scaling in the inelastic Charles scattering cross section uh, and also how come the exponent came out to be fractional supposed to be one which this uh, uh, lambda type of description mentioned as the first alternative I would have uh, predicted. So by having this math like physics uh, uh, to go along the critical uh, the uh, critical fluctuations of the magnetic order parameter, we end up with uh, uh, a uh, feature some features in the uh, spin dynamics that uh, uh, are largely compatible with uh, the experiment that motivated this line of theoretical work. Uh, this collapse of energy scale and destruction of condo effect has other consequences beyond uh, inelastic neutral scattering, which was not known at the time. Uh, so we made the prediction that Fermi surface uh, would jump uh, if you scan the system uh, isothermally uh, across the quantum critical point, tuning the control parameter if you can go to lower and lower uh, temperatures. That's because uh, here the, uh, there's this kind of singular formation. There's the formation of these uh, quasi particles. How fragile they are, the, the quasi particle weight Z is non zero. And as a result, these composite fermions are formed. They're part of an electron count. This Fermi surface, which I was giving you schematics about, would be expanded to include these. Uh, Quasi particles that are associated with localized spins. Well, on the left, um, that process is down, so uh, the Fermi surface would be entirely made of the internal uh, electrons. So there would be a jump, a large jump, from the Fermi surface across a continuous uh, phase transition uh, in the uh, low temperature limit. And so there was a massive amount of experimental efforts uh, to look for the Fermi surface jump. And by now, there's quite extensive evidence in, within this class of correlated materials, in which across the quantum critical point, Fermi surface experience jump. Initial experiment was done by uh, Dresden, Silver Parshing, and the collaborators uh, in these materials. Uh, and as a matter, uh, physicists love quantum oscillations and the uh, gold standard of measuring Fermi surface that has also provided evidence for a jump of Fermi surface when the tuning parameter conditions are suitable and, 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 uh, and in other materials as well. So uh, that raises the question, can, how could it be that transition, the phase transition is continuous, yet something is jumping? Uh, the Fermi surface would be jumping. How could that be possible? The only way for that to happen, uh, uh, well, that be uh, possible is that in fact, if I have a large Fermi surface on which the quasi particle Z is non zero in this phase, and I have a small Fermi on the left, I have a very different uh, volume uh, area in this plot, uh, and uh, uh, Z on the small Fermi surface will be non zero here. You have a Fermi liquid, Fermi liquid, but when they reach the quantum critical point, also sets of the Zs at these two sets of Fermi surfaces they have to go to zero zero temperature and zero frequency limit. In other words, quasi particles must be lost entirely on all the Fermi set. Suppose the England Landau description where quasi particles would be lost only in 
very small portion of Fermi surface. Directly testing that experimentally is very hard. Uh, there was some thermal conductivity measurement uh, that was done. Uh, I think the conclusion was reasonably uh, robust in favor of loss of quasi particles, but there's a difference of opinions, of interpretation of data measured by three different groups. Uh, that prompted my colleague, uh, Jack Natelson, uh, uh, at Rice using the MBE films made in Vienna, the circular Parsons group. Uh, they did the nanofabrications, eventually measure something called short noise. And there was a big talk back here uh, last week here in Aspen. Lo and behold, the short noise is extremely reduced in these uh, quantum critical systems uh, compared to simple metals like gold in such a way that the system is closer to uh, having uh, continuous flow as opposed to be discrete sound distributed like a chunk flow. If, if, if the short noise, you can think about raindrops uh, on top of your, your, your home uh, on the roof. And even though they are coming down, still they are drop by drop, you can hear it, that's a noise. The, the current would be a function of time. And so if you have quasi particles, those are the current carriers. There's a discreteness associated with the, the carriers uh, that's carrying the current. That's why noise has should it be uh, have some particular value. Uh, but uh, if you're closer to the continuous flow limit, the 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 raindrop uh, if the rain is coming down continuously, continuous fluid, you can hardly hear noise. So that's why it's reduced. So so um, um, uh, so that's. Uh, so far, the most direct evidence that quasi particles actually lost, even though theoretically we, we would expect it using this distribution. So, um, I have one more slide. Uh, uh, well, I'm lying, two slides uh, on this uh, part of loss of quasi particles, which is that uh, in the Landau description, if I have an empty fellow magnetic or some magnetic water state uh, to a parallel magnetic phase transition, the only criticality. I expect to see is the, the magnetic sector, which is why the last neutral scattering measurement of spin dynamics is such an important role for this class of materials. But if it involves this condo effect, in fact, the history of a condo effect is a, was a mystery uh, in the 1930s that electrical resistivity versus temperature was showing some strange minimum. So, so the electrons have charge, which are coupled to the spins. So the charge sector actually is involved. And you can also think about this maximal entangled state of down minus down electrons. The, uh, the electrons are involved. And so even though the spin degree freedoms are forming the entanglement, the charge is also uh, participating. So we can uh, work out the, the um, microscopic, say that for this class of quantum critical point, not only the magnetic sector is quantum critical, but singular, uh, but also charge sector. And uh, this is yet another set of measurements done by, uh, using the MBE films of Vienna group. And uh, this is my colleague, John Kono, who did kilohertz measurement. He show that the charge sector also has this uh, like H bar omega of an ABT scaling in this kilohertz op optical conductivity. So this is a very interesting from statistical mechanics perspective how quantum entanglement exists up with uh, quantum criticality, but it also has important implications because spins are the main agent. These are the building blocks that's driving this quantum criticality. We have a huge, it's a very large number of degrees freedom. We, and as a matter of physics, like to count degrees freedom, well, everybody should count the degrees freedom in terms of entropy. And so there's a analog two, or almost analog two, 50% uh, uh, of that, uh, that's associated with the critical fluctuations. But it lives in the spin sector. But if the charge sector is also uh, picking that up, we could possibly uh, now think that it's connected to superconductivity to this holy grail of the mechanism of superconductivity. So I'm going to turn following this route uh, to how this loss of quasi particles in the state above superconducting transition temperature in a normal, normal state, what's the implication for superconducting? Pairing, and uh, we'll continue with this route, except that now I cannot look at the fate of one local moment embedded in these uh, uh, backgrounds. I need to at least two of these, a cluster of these, in order to construct any unconventional pairing uh, objects.
And so that's what we did, uh, setting up equations. And, and physics followed from this formalism, the sense that if I have things coupled a anti-fellowmagnet RKKY interaction, I know that it can form spin singlet uh, up down minus down, down up of these uh, local moments. And that I explicitly see in solving these equations because uh, in the phase diagram, uh, there's uh, a small uh, region called IS, which stands for intersite singlet, which is a spin singlet associated with uh, this RKKY any fellow magnetic interactions. And, and the, the fact, I don't really particularly care whether it exists or not, but if it exists, it's good because it indicates that everywhere there's dynamical correlations between the spins, the singular sector. And that's very important because uh, the beginning of high TC field, Phil Anderson was telling us about RVB. This is like, like almost like RVB uh, in, uh, in, in a bond. And now the fact, that uh, uh, the charge sector is also critical means that the spin singular correlations will be leaked uh, to the charge sector. And we know for good reason that if there's a spin singular correlation, uh, it would promote pairing in the spin singlet and even parity channel. Uh, I, this is some calculation that backs up the assertion. And so, so that what comes out is the following physical picture, which we see in the, uh, in the result of the calculation. Namely, you have the competition of the anti fellow many interactions between the spins, which builds up these spin singlet correlations that involve degree freedoms, which have very large uh, entropy, which is a lot of them. And uh, at the same time, I also mentioned that the Fermi surface is undergoing reconstruction, meaning that in this quantum critical region, in the strange metal region, the entire Fermi surface is affected. So, so all the states on the Fermi surface can take advantage of these spin singlet correlation driven spin singlet superconducting pairing. And so it's a combination of the two worlds, the spin spin interactions. And the fact that the entire Fermi surface is participating in the formation uh, in driving this type of unconventional pairing, That's in the end makes the superconducting TC be some percentage of bare Fermi scale as opposed to n to the minus four of that. So we surmise, uh, we propose that this is a mechanism to understand this is highest TC in this class of materials is actually only 2.3 Kelvin. So it's a very small in the absolute sense. But if you measure it in terms of effective Fermi energy, this would be 5%. And the theoretical calculation gets to a few percent. Once again, the physical picture, the numbers are not particularly important. The physical picture is that you have competing processes, the exchange interaction between spins, Spins coupled to the, the conduction and the actual the counter process, which was responsible for the quantum critical point. To begin with, they end up uh, combine, cooperate, give a uh, superconductivity that's more robust than the conventional BCS uh, pairing. And so that uh, pretty much I've emphasized uh, this uh, quantum critical point going from anti fellow magnet side to the parallel magnet side going through a point that uh, uh, one of the things that has come up in these different or the materials is that if you have quantum fluctuations, could it be associated with zero temperature point? Could also be associated with zero temperature region. We were able to generalize uh, the type of consideration which I've uh, mentioned to you uh, with the loss of quasi particles, which in the zero temperature limit would be confined to this point if you are doing this trajectory. Uh, to a more broader perspective where it could be a phase. So in that sense, whether it's a quantum critical point or quantum critical phase is really uh, in the overall scheme of things, a small uh, difference. Uh, the importance is that there's this type of real round out uh, quantum critical situations as controlling physics. It's kind of, uh, I'm not gonna tell you what these parameters are, except to say that it's actually guided 
because these materials have so many members, uh, there's actually extensive efforts of putting these different materials in different portions of the global phase diagram to explore uh, the connection with theory and back to theory. Now, make one more point before I move on to the topology point, and it's on the topology fund, which is that uh, I've uh, mentioned that I want to focus on this particular class of materials, particular type of microscopic models to gain intuition, but the hope is that the physics that we've learned uh, could have implications broader class of the materials. And I put up this slide just to, to get uh, Greg Boybinger's um, uh, uh, maybe reacting yeah. tomorrow. But in the cooperates, there's some indication for that kind of Fermi surface change as well. And, uh, and a variety of other materials I listed at the beginning, organics, ion-based superconductors, and this uh, now emerging um, uh, sort of uh, material class with a lot of attention, the magic angle, the bilayer graphene also have some evidence in this type of physics. So I think still a discussion topic, how universal this kind of uh, unusual phenomena uh, really happens across the different materials. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. Okay, so I just want to very quickly, I'm not going to go into the details, uh, this kind of loss of quasi particles provide a way of thinking, uh, of linking uh, to the topology fund. Uh, when, you, uh, when one mentions topology, most of you, even I think, even the uh, astrophysics colleagues would have heard the quantum Hall effect. Quantum Hall effect is based on nine interacting electrons. But there's also a fractional quantum Hall effect, which wouldn't have existed without interaction. So these are new states of matter that cannot exist without considering interaction. So in this inserting type of topological state, that's a very established fact that interactions can drive new type of uh, topological states. In metallic settings, it's a much newer uh, subject, but that's not here. And I want to make the case that loss of quasi particles is a way, is the analog for metallic topological states. Uh, it's the analog of going from Quantum hall, integer quantum hall, fractional quantum hall, because once the quasi particles are lost, these are genuinely new states that cannot be adiabatically connected to the non interacting electron description. So I want to very quickly run through uh, two, uh, two uh, examples. One is these condo driven, uh, it's called Y or semi metals. The details are not, not very important. It's basically very similar physics of these fragile quasi particles. Because they are so fragile, the energy scale is low, so physics must be staying near the Fermi energy. And that's good because it's not fine tuned. If you end up with these wire nodes, it must be affecting low energy uh, physics. So we started thinking about such a, a problems. It's the same type of calculation, except using lattices, the crystalline uh, symmetries, uh, 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 sort of you know, with a particular tension. So this is like a lattice, it's a three dimensional analog famous graphene, which lives uh, in two dimensions. Along this thinking, actually, uh, and, uh, five years ago, we had the two working groups who didn't know each other uh, participating as a working groups, Aspen Center of Physics. One is, involved me and the other involves Jen Cano, who's the audience. And for treaters, timing made the two groups to interact with each other. And actually something came out of it that uh, we are very proud of. So that's that's the development that's going along this direction. Now, these are the, the condo lattice, which I described for you, involving the particular unit cell, one local moment, and a species of conduction electron. Once I get to that part of the world, I can, I can change to a neighboring, neighboring state, right? So, so the neighboring uh, set of model is that in, instead of involving one conduction electron with one local moment, you have two bands, two channels, of conduction electrons interacting with local moment. That's very much the, the, the building up the degrees freedoms. Then we can solve this problem uh, to show that there's still wire nodes, except that uh, these peaks are very broad, signifying that the quasi particles lost. And some more details about it. So these are unfirm liquid state, it shows a topology, and uh, no, those states are not 
fuzzy particles. In fact, we know it's a fractionalized and uh, there's some unusual behavior in the spectral uh, properties. But the important point is that it's an example that we can go from a logical state that's controlled by fuzzy particles, however fragile they are, to topological states which lose the quasi particle description. So, this is an entirely new set of topo topological states. So, uh, again, it's, uh, it's through correlation physics that enrich the topology, but uh, inversely, uh, topological characteristics also enrich uh, the uh, correlation physics. And maybe there's some new phases in the kind of global phase diagram that I um, asked you earlier. So, one minute. Um, these are all, I've stayed the details, the specific examples, this F electron based materials. I said, the reason I want to do that is because there are electrons in the flow lanes and electrons in the fast lane. Turns out that you don't have to involve these uh, uh, F electrons that only act up uh, at very low temperatures, maybe Kelvin and below. You can actually also go to transition metal systems which are much higher energy scales and lattice has some particular geometry. So it turns out that frustration of lattices, something that's a glue together, if you glue together these triangles, you form this agami lattice. Some variation of that is gluing together these kind of unit cells, uh, which we call over lattice. Turns out there's some local states you can construct that cannot move around. And that's actually not a precise statement. Now we can do one year function constructions to make these uh, precise, but the point of physics is that the compact local states, which almost act like atomic F, orbit, F electrons in the sense that they cannot uh, uh, readily move, around, move along. And so we take advantage of this recognition of uh, uh, these kind of compact local states. These are molecular orbitals which cannot move along. Uh, very easily, and then the other orthogonal molecule orbitals move along with very fast regular conduction electron speed. And lo and behold, even though it has no atomic F electrons, we end up with the same model, condo lattice model. Some, just some topological. And then we can solve it, show that these kind of large Fermi surface to small Fermi surface quantum phase transition that's continuous and therefore a the critical point arises. Uh, and uh, very recently, we're able to study the finite temperature dynamics to show uh, that, in fact, kind of H bar omega over KVT scaling, which got us started to think about strange metallicity of these uh, particular class uh, of extremely correlated actual systems, in fact, also show up in these uh, topological open system. So, um, so I'm over time, but just very quickly recap. Uh, I stick my neck out to say that these are three most, uh, at least to me, most important issues in the coil electron community. At least if, if, not, if not everybody agrees they are top three, I think they belong to top 10, sure. And, uh, and I give you some sense of uh, specific aspects of the coil electron uh, physics problems that uh, connect with these essential questions of the uh, coil field. And I just put the, the summary up. I talk about lots of quasi particles uh, in a class of extremely correlated um, uh, electron systems, jump of Fermi surface, lots of quasi particles, and the implication of that, uh, the, the very physics, very competition of the terms in the Hamiltonian that drive quantum criticality, in fact, is promoting ITC or C2 conductivity. I give you uh, some hint about uh, this kind of physics that we study in all materials uh, making making connections uh, with uh, the new, new, new frontiers that connects with uh, the topological aspects of the electron. Thank you, Chimia, for a grand tour of the correlated electron problems. Uh, let me ask, ask questions now with one ground rule. The experts 
in the field don't ask questions yet. Questions from not experts. And let you uh, handle the questions. And please repeat the questions for the sake of the Zoomers. Yeah, please. Let me just repeat the question. So the question was that uh, the quasi-particles which, which I described, core electron systems, they are collective states and uh, they come from some combination of the bare electrons. Now, uh, 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 in the topological states of matter, uh, is the manifest manifestation of topology connected with that kind of collectiveness or not? Is that a fair? Uh, representation of the question. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So, so the the for the first part, the short answer is that's somewhat different. So, yeah, uh, probably it's good to have a picture of Barry face in mind when you change the parameter of a model. Uh, the eigenstate would evolve, and that. Uh, evolution builds up uh, a berry phase, which is really at the heart of topology, in particular, non interacting topology we are familiar with. So, a short, the very first Fermi surface I showed had a little box in it. And that's what we call the Brian zone. So, because of a crystalline lattice, only a subset of the wave vector space really comes into play. And but still, I have a set wave vectors. I have a single particle states which are evolving from one point to another point in the whole real zone, accumulates barrier phase. That's at the heart of topology, right? So at the end of the day, it is single electron states, uh, except that there's adiabaticity and uh, there's a collection of them that, that is responsible for the kind of topology that we most talk about, uh, integer quantum hall. Um, Topological insulators, while semi metals, and so on. So, what I said is that if you combine that kind of Barry phase physics with the electrostatic uh, interaction physics, you could have new type topological states. If you can realize that, it's very interesting because topology gives you protection, robustness, and the interaction, as we learn. Uh, as as, we, as I uh, illustrated, gives you control, a uh, small amount of laboratory, uh, laboratory accessible pressure, magnetic field can go from one type of correlated state to another. So if, if you can get the barrier phase physics, the correlation physics cooperate, you can create a new type of topological states that have the good things of both worlds. So, so the, the uh, loss of quasi particles is a vehicle to create topological states that's not adiabatically connected with the non-interacting limit. Any other questions, comments? Questions from experts? <laughs> so actually, this is something that I couldn't write down. No. So there's always this notion of what is there on, and how, did, how does that work across a counter dispersion system? Yeah. So, um, so let me repeat the question. So. Uh, so Matt, my colleague, uh, asked that if the Fermi sur surface is, is jumping, uh, how does it uh, connect with something we call Lattinger theorem, which connects a number of uh, electrons that you begin with, uh, with uh, the size of the Fermi surface. And uh, so, so the uh, transition I focus most attention on from the parallel magnetic phase, which has a larger Fermi surface, the anti fellow magnetic phase, which has small Fermi surface. In fact, uh, the, the Lattinger theorem is very readily satisfied because the small Fermi surface phase 
actually has a broken other symmetry. And so that changes the Brian zone. And uh, uh, so that it can be made compatible, except that the transition is continuous. There's some uh, shape of the a topology of the Fermi surface, which uh, would differentiate in this type of transition with, uh, with the, the ones that uh, in which the underlying Fermi surface doesn't change size. If you go to what I call the P sub S phase, I don't expect you to remember that, but in this global phase diagram, there's a, a parallel magnetic phase uh, in which uh, you could also have a small Fermi surface. Then one has to work a bit harder to ask the local moment part which uh, is coexisting with the small Fermi surface electron fluid, uh, will also come into play when you uh, look at Luttinger theorem in some particular way. Without going into details, you can think about box insertion and other type of procedures, to see uh, how um, uh, can be compatible with the Luttinger theorem. You, you spent quite a bit of time talking about the weight of the particle peak in the in the spectral function. And when you were talking about jumping from large to small family surfaces, you said that Z goes to zero in the limit of zero temperature. And so you lose the quasi particles, but yet at finite temperature in that phase diagram, there's a broad range of your uh, phase space where Z goes to zero. And either I missed it or you didn't tell me. Yeah, so, uh, so Greg asked that, um, the issue of uh, uh, the quasi particles of the large Fermi surface, which is one side of the zero temperature phase transition, the quasi particles of the small Fermi surface, which is uh, the other side of the phase transition. How, how do those two features connect with Z going to zero at the quantum critical point at zero temperature or sort of the, the finite temperature region? Yeah. So. So the uh, sharp statement is that at zero temperature, Z is non-zero for both sides. It goes to zero uh, in, uh, at the quantum critical point. That's only one point in parameter space. But the fact that the quantum critical point is a ground state, just like the two sides uh, uh, are. So as a particular type of excitation spectrum, many body excitation spectrum, it's associated with it. And that, that's the excitation spectrum which controls physics in this tornado region that uh, comes out of this anchoring quantum uh, critical point. And uh, I don't know whether that's good in, uh, enough to get a picture of it, but point is that Z goes to zero uh, in a zero temperature limit signifies a particular type of many body spectrum power of states that's distinct from the Fermi liquid type of many body state. Yeah, um, back to phase diagrams and, and all that, uh, would you call the strange metal a separate phase of matter? Is it productive to call it that? And if, if yes, then the question is, Fermi liquid, which supposedly is robust, somehow just crosses over into it. Or is it more productive to call strange metal some bizarre crossover phenomena that doesn't really has a, a phase associated? Yeah, so, so for that, maybe I can uh, repeat the question, but also uh, go back to us particular slide, which I think it's a very important. So, so the question was, um, if you, uh, do we think about quantum criticality? Is a, is a, a distinct state of matter or could it be just crossovers at some finite energy? Is that a fair uh, way of representing it? And so, so I think for, for practical purposes, if we want to connect with the kind of questions and issues coming out of the experiment, maybe the precise answer is not all that important. I think it's very good that in the zero temperature limit, there are either a point uh, that, you know, if I scan, I don't know whether the cursor is showing up. If I scan along trajectory one in the zero temperature uh, limit, I'm going to have a point that describes this quantum critical state. If I follow trajectory three, I'm going to have a region, a, a segment that's associated with the quantum critical state. So in the, in the standard terminology, I should probably call this as a phase and that point as a point which is not a phase, right? It's a boundary 
between the phases. But, uh, and you can even go through some other trajectories without running through singularity, in which case you would have, uh, you have the possibility of a very large dynamical range with physics where there's a quantum fluctuations is anchored by either by this point or uh, by this phase. And the important point is, to me is that if you have a phase diagram like this, um, there, there's a, a, a zero temperature parameter region uh, that's controlled the physics that gives rise to this very amplified quantum fluctuations. And if, even if I don't go to zero temperature, I don't hit any of this segment or point, I still have, I'm seeing the quantum fluctuation. So, so in the, uh, so this is a little bit of for the expert in the cube plates, the big debate of kind of singularity that's seeing near optical, optimal superconducting doping is associated with the collective physics, such as these quantum fluctuations, or could it be some special features of the band structure, the Van Hoff singularity is yeah. responsible. So I think in a context like this, uh, one doesn't really need to differentiate to whether there's a point or segment or a phase that's underlying such quantum fluctuations. Okay. Yeah, so I think I will add one conjecture. She said zero temperature, really zero temperature, all metal, all normal metals are strange. And, but the temperature is very small, e, like E to the minus one, E to the minus 130, 37 of the Fermi temperature. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. So, so, that's right, good. <laughs> so let me thank you. Let, let us all thank Jimmy once again for this lovely talk and uh, wine and cheese is beckoning outside. Thank you.